Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. And welcome to our fourth athlete development workshop. Today's presentation or workshop is on the student athlete college recruitment process. And our facilitator is Ms. Anistia Wood. Before I tell you more about Ms. Wood, just some housekeeping matters, please ensure that your mic is muted during the presentation and you can turn it on to answer or ask a question. Also, please ensure that your name is your real name. Also, place your sport association and country so we can identify you easily. Miss Anistia Wood is a former national and professional volleyball player. She represented Barbados in indoor volleyball and beach volleyball for 15 years and had a brief stint with the Barbados national basketball team. She also played professional volleyball in Italy and Spain for four years. Anisia gained a volleyball scholarship and competed collegiately at the NCAA level for three seasons with St. John's University, New York, and one season with the University of New Haven, Connecticut. She attained a Bachelor of Arts degree, MBA in Global Marketing, and most recently achieved an MSc degree in Sport and Exercise Sciences. She currently holds the post of PRO on the Executive Board of the Barbados Volleyball Association and sits on the Barbados Olympic Executive Board as the Chair of the Athletes Commission. Anisia is the founder of Carib Athletes, a college sports recruiting network dedicated specifically towards showcasing the athletic skills of Caribbean athletes through college recruiting videos, recruiting resumes, and online profiles. In addition, Carib Athletes provides assistance in navigating through the college recruiting process all with the aim of helping Caribbean athletes gain opportunities to compete at the collegiate level across the USA and Canada. So Ms. Wood will take over from here. Welcome Ms. Wood and everyone else. Okay, my, my mic was muted. Good evening to everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, so good evening. And I just wanna welcome everyone who is joining the workshop this evening on student athlete college recruitment. I'm happy to share my knowledge and my experience with you all. As you would have heard, I am a former volleyball player. So I too, we're at a point where many of you guys are at now, um, wondering how to start and, and where to go. So I'm hoping at the end of the, the webinar, you all will gain a foundation, so to speak, on which you can build upon. But before we start, just like so I get an idea of whether we have athletes, parents, or coaches, and the sport, which would actually help, which sport you're, you actually compete in or you're associated with, could you kindly just place that in the chat quickly for me? So if you're an athlete, you state that. If you're a parent, if you're a coach, if you're an, another stakeholder, so be it. And the sport that you are associated with before we start. So I'm saying parent and coach and swimming. Basketball. Okay. All right, so we have a few basketball players here. Seeing a trap as well. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're gonna, well, I am gonna cover in the workshop. So I'm gonna generally discuss the college recruitment process. Um, this could be very extensive. So there's only so much we can cover in this session. So I selected these areas that you could see on the screen. I think they're great starting points for any prospective student athlete parent trying to figure out where to go, how to go about it. So this evening to start, I'm gonna 
talk about the options of play and by extension, the opportunities of play, um, meaning the different co collegiate associations and their member institutions. And I, when I use the word institutions, I'm referring to universities and colleges. And after that, we'll get into scholarships. What does the athletic scholarship actually mean? The type of scholarships available. And I think that is a great background to start. And then we'll build upon, upon that and get into the process of college recruitment. So the various steps are the general steps an athlete should take when they're trying to get recruited. And we'll look at the recruiting timeline in terms of what you should be doing, let's say in form three or a third form. I don't know what you guys call it in your country. And some tips and takeaways. And obviously, we'll have a little time for questions and answers, Q&A at the end. I'll probably cut a little bit halfway in between to, to pause to answer, answer some questions as well. So let's start with the options of play. So to truly understand the recruitment process, I know you guys are pretty much, you have to basically understand what the options of plays are, play are, plays, <laughs> the option of play. And collegiate, I'm sure a lot of you guys know collegiate sports is a billion dollar industry and it is highly focused in the North American region. So particularly uh, USA and Canada. We will focus more on the US market, but I will touch upon Canada as well. So we will focus on the NCAA, which I'm sure many of you guys have heard of before, the NAIA, the NJCAA, and we'll get into what these associations actually mean. And then we'll look a bit at Canada and the, the, they have the CCAA and, and new sports. So let's consider the USA and Canadian collegiate sports market apply. So collectively between the two countries, there are over 2,100 institutions. And remember, these are colleges and, and, and universities I'm referring to with collegiate sport programs. Now, in the US, obviously, they have the bulk of the collegiate sports. So you have about 2,000 institutions in the US. And then in Canada, there are about 150. In the USA, there are three bodies that govern collegiate sports. And the largest of the three is the NCAA, which stands for National Collegiate Athletic Association. And then there's the NAIA. Um, the NAIA is not a, quite as large as the NCAA, but they too govern collegiate sports at various collegiate institutions. And the NA, NAIA refers to the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics. And there, then there is the NJCAA, which is a National Junior College Athletic Association. And these three governing bodies govern majority of the collegiate sports within the, US, the USA. There are other bodies such as the California Community College Athletic Association and some others, but these are the three main um, governing bodies for our collegiate sports. When we go across to Canada, there are two bodies. Um, you have the CCAA, which is Canadian Collegiate Athletic Association, and that governs colleges, college sports, in Canada, and there's a distinct difference between colleges and universities in Canada. Um, I find in the USA, they use a term interchangeably, but in Canada, they have a distinct difference. And then there is U Sports, which governs university sport in Canada. Now, as I mentioned before, there are about a thousand colleges and universities with collegiate sporting programs in the NCAA, and that is the largest body for college sports. You will find about 250 in the NAIA, and around 500, a little over 500 in the Junior College Association. And in Canada, you would find about 98 in CCAA and 56 in U Sports. So to get into this, let's look a little deeper at the NCAA. And as mentioned before, it is the largest of the three governing bodies in the USA, um, consisting of roughly half a million student athletes who compete in about at about a thousand colleges and universities across 24 recognized sports. And that is across three divisions. So there's NCAA division one, division two, and division three. And these are sports like baseball, volleyball, tennis, track and field, basketball, just to name a few. There are more sports though outside of this 24, but these sports aren't referred to as official sports. So when I say official sports, these are actually sports that are sponsored by the NCAA. So, here you have the dots on the map, which kind of give a, a visual representation of the institutions and where they're located. And as you can see highlighted here in the green, well, let's start with the blue. Division one is represented in the blue and this consists of about 350 colleges across the, the USA. Um, division two, about 
310, and that is in the orange. And then you have Division Three, which holds 40% of the market, um, the collegiate sports market, and that is about 438. Now, these numbers, though, might vary due to COVID. You know, there are a lot of, well, they, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are some universities who ended certain sporting programs, the, the sporting programs that weren't the, the most popular. So we were playing water polo or fencing some universities because they couldn't fund those sports. They actually closed those programs altogether. And then there are some universities that actually closed because they couldn't um, afford to carry on. So the, this number could be a little bit more, a little bit less, give or take. So among the three divisions in the NCAA, Division I schools manage the, the largest athletic budgets and the level of competition is, you, it is the highest amongst the, the three divisions. So if you follow, let's say, coll collegiate basketball or American football, you would find out a percentage, a small percentage though, but a percentage of these athletes will want to play professional sports because they are that good. So the competition at the Division I level is, is the highest of the three. And of course, they also offer the most generous number of scholarships, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. When it comes to Division II, student athletes and programs, they're also competitive, but not at the, not the same level of, of that of Division I. And generally, Division II programs, they don't have the financial resources to devote to their athletic programs like those institutions in, in D1. So I'm sure many of you guys are probably on TikTok or Instagram and you know you see videos of collegiate athletes posting video their videos of the gear or the apparel that they receive and if they are a division one student athlete you'll find post all these sneakers and tops and flip-flops and buys and a lot of gear that they get but when you look at if you were to compare that to uh, a division division two athlete they get the the necessary stuff so they might get a pair of playing shoes a pair of walking shoes maybe a, a top maybe a bag and that is it. So this is where the financial resources differ as well in terms of, of course, the scholarship money, but tuition, but some fees, but the other resources that they have that they could actually supply to the athletes when it comes to apparel and, and gear. Um, division three schools are completely different. Um, this is the largest division in terms of the number of institutions, but these schools do not offer athletic scholarships. So you would find there are athletic scholarships at the D1 and D2 level, but the Division III level, you don't receive athletic scholarships. Students can compete collegiately, but they would receive, if they do have get any sort of funding, it would be academic funding that they would get. So you would find these students are those that don't necessarily, uh, how should I say, suit it. They don't, academics is more important to them than sports, but they want to compete. They still have the skill set that they could compete, so they would more go to Division III schools. All right. Then there is the NAIA. So this is a much smaller association with close to about 80,000 student athletes competing across 250 member institutions. And they are four year colleges and universities across the NAIA. They compete in about 15 NAIA championship sports across 21 conferences. And the dots here again, gives you a representation of the areas these institutions are located. Much like the US, you would find a lot of institutions are located towards the East and the Mideast, some in the West as well. Like the NCAA, again, NAIA, they do as well offer athletic scholarships. Um, they, there's only one division though, for the majority of the sports, but you'll find in basketball, and we have some basketballers here. They are, that is one of the only sports that actually have a division one and division two for the NAIA. All right, and again, most of the sports are similar. You have the basketball, the soccer or football, as we call it in the Caribbean, track and field, softball, volleyball, and some other sports as well. And then there is the Junior College Association. Um, this is sometimes referred to as JUCO or JC Colleges or Junior College, as I mentioned before, and these are two-year programs. So two-year universities where an athlete can go and receive their associate degree. Um, you find a lot of athletes, there are some athletes that use this pathway. Um, let's say if their grades don't meet the standards of four-year universities, with the admission standards, they would use the junior college route as a route that they could actually go into um, to get into four-year universities. So this is a, a stepping stone for some athletes, and there are about three divisions in, in the NJCAA. 
participate in about 16 sports across 24 regions, unlike the NCAA, which refers to use as conferences, um, the NJCAA, they use regions, which really is associated with their regional structure. So your region is based on, let's say you're in the East, you're in the West, but it's really similar to the conference name as well. So it's based on their geographic location. Junior colleges to offer scholarships, could be full scholarships, partial scholarships. The amount though of the scholarship is not as great as that that would be offered in the NCAA or the NAIA. Um, but on the flip side, the cost of attending is often less. So the cost, the tuition costs at most junior colleges um, are much lower than that at a four-year university or college, okay? So let's go, let's go across to Canada quickly. Um, as I mentioned before, Canada, there is U-Sports and the CCAA. So U-Sports, this is a national uh, governing body for university sport in Canada. In U-Sports, there are roughly 14,000 student athletes across 56 institutions. Obviously, this number is much smaller than that um, in the USA. And there are four conferences across 12 sports. In Canada, you have rugby. Um, you'll find that in Canada, they have they offer different sports, um, similar sports as that of the USA, but you'll find you could get rugby there and some other sports that you won't find in the US. And they too, there's a general misconception that can Canadian schools don't offer scholarships, but they have been uh, developing their, let's say, athletic programs throughout the years. So they don't necessarily call them scholarships, they call them athletic. I think they call it athletic financial aid where they actually give tuition and fees, but that is the max amount that they could actually give to a, a student. So that is the max amount a student can actually receive for athletic related activities. So it cannot exceed that value. And you would find though, as much as a scholarship amount may not be as much as that in the States, the cost of attending university in Canada is much cheaper than that in, in the States. So where, let's say the cost of a typical Canadian university could be from, let's say 5,000 5, to 6,000 Canadian a year, you would find an NCAA university or an AIA university, our college could range between 25,000 US to 40,000 US a year. So there's a, you know, there's pros and cons to, to both, both situations. And then there is the CCAA which as I mentioned before, is the Canadian Collegiate Athletic Association. This governs colleges, so college sports um, in Canada. And this is basically the equivalent to organized sports at the university level. Again, here you have uh, student athletes that compete at about 90 institutions. Um, there are six conferences across the different provinces in Canada. And again, here you find athletic scholarships, athletic financial aids are, available as well. The difference, what I must note here, which I could get into a little later too, the difference too between playing collegiately in the USA and playing collegiately in Canada, you get four years of eligibility. So you're eligible to compete for four years at an American university. However, in Canada, you get five years of, of eligibility. And I will get into that again when we get to scholarships. So now that you all have an idea of the options of play. We now have to basically look at what are the available opportunities to play a, a collegiate sport. And this depends on a, a number of factors. Um, the table on the left shows a representation of the approximate number of schools with collegiate sport programs. Um, again, this could be slightly off, but the number of student athletes that you see here um, and also it shows the number of student athletes and it also gives you a visual representation of the number of scholarships per year um, that these university, these associations actually award to the, the associated institutions. And athletes, I know basically the athletes online, when you think of playing a sport in college, you think of receiving some form of scholarship money, um, whether it be athletic or academic to allow, um, you know, to finance your tuition costs and uh, whether it be room and board, food, housing, because tuition <laughs> isn't cheap. So looking at this table, you would realize that the scholarship numbers look good, but this can be somewhat deceiving because there are a number of factors that influence these numbers. Um, 
And basically that would influence your opportunity to play a collegiate sport if, the scholar, if it is a scholarship that you're looking for. So these factors here, if you look at the funnel on the right hand side, um, are actually the, the sport itself. Like not every sport is offered at every single institution. So here, if you look at division one, NCAA division one, it shows 348 schools in division one, but that does not mean that every single school would offer, let's say, women's soccer or women's basketball. That number is just a representation of all the schools in the NCAA that have collegiate sports. Um, so then there is the number of scholarships awarded per institution. This is another factor as well. Remember I mentioned before the NCAA Division I schools have the largest athletic budgets and offer the, the most generous amount of scholarships more than any other association. But the sport comes into play as well because if you're looking at an example, Division I volleyball, each Division I volleyball program allocates 12 scholarships per women's team. But on the flip side, if you are a male and you are into volleyball, it is only 4.5 scholarships per team. So here you're looking at maybe 300 plus universities that have the collegiate volleyball program and offering 12 scholarships per team. So 12 scholarships by that 300. And then if you're looking at the men's volleyball program, I want to say that they men's volleyball, they're probably under maybe a little bit over 100 universities that actually offer men's volleyball. And they only offer 4.5 scholarships per team. So th those 4.5 scholarships have to be basically split amongst our roster is about 14, 15 players. So therefore every single player would not, it's hardly likely that a coach would give one person a full scholarship. So these are some of the factors that you have to consider. And then we also have to look at the type of scholarship. Um, using the NCAA division one as an example, these scholarships ba vary based on what they call headcount scholarships and equivalency um, scholarships. If a sport is a headcount sport, that means that each scholarship is absolute, meaning that the number of athletes, student athletes receiving awards cannot exceed this particular number. And I'll use volleyball again. So in D1, women's volleyball, which is a headcount sport, 12 scholarships are awarded per every single division one program. So that means that 12 players have to get full scholarships. You cannot split those scholarships amongst 14 players. So basically every single one of those 12 players, if your roster is 12, if your roster is 13, whatever, but 12 players have to get a scholarship. Let's say your roster is 14, maybe those other two are on academic scholarship or maybe walk-ons, but 12 players have to get, each player have to get a full scholarship. Now compare that with uh, men's volleyball. Men's volleyball will be considered an equivalency sport. So they have equivalency scholarships. And what that means is it's really a partial scholarship model. They offer 4.5 scholarships, but they can the coach can divide those scholarships as he sees fit. So if he's, let's say he sees a player or recruits a player that is really, really good, he could say, you know what, I'm going to give you three quarters of one scholarship and kind of divide that other three. Well, my math isn't the best, but divide the other scholarships according to the, let's say, 14 players on the roster. All right, so as I mentioned before, with equivalency sport, it's hardly, it's, it's unlikely that a, a coach would actually give you a full ride, meaning a full scholarship, and have to split those little scholarships amongst the, the other players. And that is really the different, difference between the types of scholarships. And this really applies to NCAA Division I. You would find that uh, Division II, NAIA, and JCAA, they use equivalency type scholarships, whereas Division one, division one is the only division that actually have headcount scholarships. And that is really only for our six sports, which I will get into in the, in the next slide. So here I have an illustration of women's basketball and men's basketball. So here we are focusing on the number of institutions that actually offer the sport of basketball in the USA at the NCAA level. Now, basketball is one of the most sponsored um, programs. So you will find basketball at a lot of collegiate institutions, sporting, well, the sport is offered at a lot of those institutions that have collegiate sports. So those of you guys who are on here for basketball, you know, there are a lot of opportunities out there considering that this is one of the most offered sport when it comes to collegiate programs. So if you look at the map, this is a representation of where, again, the NCAA schools are located for basketball across the USA for all three divisions. Remember the colors, the blue, the orange, and the green. Now, if I click on this, does it change? So this is men's basketball. Again, a lot of programs are offered for, for men's basketball as well. 
So there are over about 2,000 institutions across the USA that offer basketball. And this is all NCAA, NCAA, and AIA, and JCA. And there are approximately 334 colleges and universities, if you're looking at the table on the right. Of that 334 colleges in the NCAA Division I, all of them offer men's basketball. So all of the college that, colleges and universities that have collegiate sport programs, all of those colleges offer men's basketball. Only, let's say, two of the 352 of those colleges offer women's basketball. So the number is quite high as well. So if you're looking at the scholarship limit now, so we have one factor. If you're looking at the scholarship limit now for Division I, 15 scholarships are allocated for each of those 352 programs for women, whereas 13 scholarships are allocated for, for men. And these are head count scholarships. So you know if you get a basketball scholarship at a Division I school, whether you are a male or, or a female, it is a full scholarship. You don't necessarily have to look for, um, let's say, fees, um, for room and board or books, you would be getting a full scholarship to cover that. Now, you would see here in this table, the NCAA Division III, they have mo most of the institutions, but these institutions don't actually offer athletic scholarships. Hence, you will notice that that space is blank under the scholarship limit. At the NAIA level, you will notice that there are two divisions for basketball. Again, if you play basketball, there are more opportunities in this particular sport than most. Um, but again, the scholarship numbers matter, right? So they, they actually offer 11 scholarships at the NAIA level. And if you're looking at the NJCA, the junior college level, they actually offer 15 scholarships for both men and women. So yes, you might say, no, I wanna play division one volleyball, basketball or division two basketball, but you might see yourself getting a better opportunity because there are more scholarship numbers at the junior college level as a stepping stone to actually enter a four-year program. And to give you all a, a idea of why this is important um, for, let's say, others who are playing different sports and knowing what the reality is, if we are, let's look at women's soccer. So we have women's soccer here. The numbers aren't bad. You will realize that there are about one th over 1,000 programs, collegiate programs that offer women's soccer, and about 831 programs that offer soccer. And this is at the NCAA level, of course, they're offered at the NAIA and junior college level as well, and in Canada. However, there are sports that aren't as popular as soccer or basketball. So we have, here you have women's rugby, which is only 21 programs that actually offer women's rugby in the States. Then you have 81 for gymnastics. And then you have, let's say 30, for a women's triathlon and women's triathlon is really an emerging sport. So if you are a triathlete and you're saying, yeah, I wanna get a scholarship, what is the reality of you actually getting a scholarship when there are thousands of other triathletes, prospective student athletes who are trying to get a scholarship at least one of these 30 schools and probably a limited number of scholarships are offered at each school. So this is important, I, I think, before you actually you know, say, this is what I wanna do, have a, a gauge of what is actually out there based on the programs, the type of scholarship that is offered and how many scholarships are offered per program. So on top of these factors, I would have mentioned um, the, the types of, of scholarships. Um, I would have mentioned the sport, the number of schools, um, all of these obviously play a part in the opportunities that are, that are available. But, but really what is an athletic scholarship? And as it states here on the slide, it is really financial aid awarded in partnership between college coaches or university coaches and the institution's athletic department to student athletes. So athletic scholarships can be awarded as full rides. You will hear the word full rides, but that is really a full scholarship. And this really covers um, all of the college and university costs, or it could be a partial scholarship that, you know, will cover some fees, maybe some of your tuition. So there are sports that offer a mixture between full rise and partial scholarships. And as I said, it's dependent on the type of scholarship, it's dependent on um, the coach discretion, how they feel, the athlete, what they think about the athlete, what the athlete is worth. Um, but let's say you get a partial athletic scholarship and your grades are good, you could also apply for academic scholarships, which could really balance out um, the tuition costs or the costs that you might come across to help with, you know, 
room and board or books and housing, well, housing and room and board is the same thing, but other costs that you might, might come across. So really the NCAA scholarships, as I mentioned, are classified as headcount scholarships and equivalency scholarships. And just to make it a little clearer, a headcount scholarship, that means that the team is really restricted in the number of athletes that can be on scholarship. So you can't divide the scholarships, as I mentioned before. If you have 12 scholarships, each athlete, if you have 12 athletes so that you recruited, if the coach recruited 12 athletes, they must each get a full scholarship. So you can't give a percentage of a scholarship to anybody. So they have to be full rides. And those full scholarships can really only happen in six sports in the NCAA Division One. That is women's volleyball, um, American football, basketball, both men and women's basketball, women's gymnastics, and women's tennis. Those are the only headcount sports in collegiate sports in general. Every other sport is really a equivalency sport where the coach is at, has the liberty to buy the scholarships how they see fit. So they really use a partial scholarship model. And with that type of model, there's no restriction on how many athletes um, can be on a scholarship. Of course, it depends on how big your roster size is, but you could divide those scholarships. The coach could divide those scholarships as they, as they see fit, all right? So that is really the difference between, between the two. So if I go to this slide to give you just a visual representation of what I was referring to, as I mentioned, most of those sports are NCAA sports are equivalency sports, which means the scholarship can be split. Um, and of course, it's up to the coach's discretion. So if you're looking here at this, this table, for well, this illustration, there is women's volleyball on the left and men's volleyball on the right. And this is division one level, yeah? Remember women's volleyball is a head count sport and men's volleyball is a equivalency sport. So if I click on this, this gives you a, a representation of those, consider this a pie. So this, this is a team, you're looking at two teams and this, each team has women's volleyball, they have 12 scholarships and each player is getting one full scholarship. Now imagine women's volleyball also have about 300 plus universities that actually offer women's volleyball. So multiply those 12 scholarships by those 300 plus, you have basically those small little pie charts illustrating that there is a lot of opportunity for girls in sports to actually who, are, who play volleyball to actually receive a scholarship at the NCAA Division One level and other divisions as well. If you look at men's volleyball, which only awards 4.5 scholarships, um, those 4.5 scholarships have to be um, divided between those 12 players, maybe if the roster has 14. So you'll see an uneven um, split here in this pie chart where maybe a coach decided, you know what, I'm going to give one person half of a scholarship and I'm going to split one scholarship between five players. Again, that is up to the coach. And these little, little pies at the side shows, you know, there aren't that many men's volleyball programs as well. So this is just a, a you know, visual representation to show you what it really um, looks like. So where are scholarships are, where could you find scholarships? Of course, they're at the division one level, NCAA division one and two level offers scholarships. Um, and NJCAA, which is junior colleges, they offer scholarships as well. But division three schools do not offer athletic scholarships. Um, again, you could get financial assistance via academic, let's say your academic grades are good, you could qualify for financial assistance, but scholarships aren't at the NJ, at the division three, three level. And when you think of um, scholarship, what do they really include? So tuition, room and board, books and fees. Um, there's something called cost of attendance. And this really applies to a lot of NCAA Division I schools that offer cost of attendance to students. So they can receive funds, additional funds um, that will help with additional costs outside of the scholarship. So let's say you need new clothes, you need to, I don't know, um, entertainment. There are some universities that actually, based on the state that the university is located in, they calculate the cost of attendance of that particular school and you could actually qualify for getting additional funding to supplement um, your cost of attending that, that university. But this is really only for a division one school. So there are obviously a lot more perks attending the division one school, again, because the budget that they have is much greater than that of others. Ooh, I went a little too fast. 
All right. So before I break to answer any questions, because I know you said a lot and we haven't really gotten into the process of recruiting, but I think this is a really a good starting point to give you an idea of what is out there. Um, this is just really a representation of the other um, programs, the programs, the scholarship limits per program for um, NCAA Division One, Division II, um, the sports. If you're viewing on your phone or a tab, obviously you might not be able to see this because it is small, but it really just shows you the sports offered at the NCAA level, the NAIA level, the junior college level, and how many scholarships are allocated to both men and women's program. Um, if we are looking at, let's see, basketball again, they offer a generous amount, but if you're looking at, let's say water polo, 4.5 scholarships. If you're a, a fencer, 4.5. So you have to be mindful of what sport you're in and what is actually out there. So this is really just, a, as I said, a visual representation to give you an idea of the sports offered and the amount of scholarships offered per team or per sport per, yeah, per sport. And again, this is this shows more Canada. You'll realize that here in Canada, you have the triathlon, the rugby, which offers, of course, much more in terms of the scholarship limits. In Canada, there's wrestling as well, a couple of water polo school, schools, equestrian. Um, equestrian is spelled wrong, but ignore that. And of course, field hockey as well. So I'm gonna pause here because I, I know I would have said a lot so far to take any questions or queries anyone might have. Um, I know if you aren't familiar with the information, it can seem a bit overwhelming. So are there any questions, comments, queries before I move on? You're pretty much halfway through. So any questions from anyone? Yes, good night. Hi. Um, my name is Petal Brown. Um, I, I have a question about the scholarships in terms of being an international athlete. Is, is there a difference in terms of how they offer funding for a full scholarship for international athletes rather than a national athlete? So you mean rather, okay, I heard you. So you mean rather than an athlete that is actually home-based, let's say American athlete? Yes. Okay. So. I'm sure you might be aware that the cost of, let's say tuition costs for a foreigner or international student is actually different from that from a, a local student. So for a coach who is recruiting outside of the USA, let's say they're recruiting someone in the Caribbean, that cost of attendance is gonna be higher than a student, a, prospect, a prospective student athlete who's actually based in, in the States. But if he's offering you a scholarship, um, you would find that I say you have two, two athletes, same skill set. So you have two volleyball players, two basketball players, same skill set. There's one in the Caribbean, one in the USA. He, if he wants, if he or she wants to offer a scholarship, maybe the same amount, they would actually have to look for more for the international student just because tuition cost is higher for an international student and there is different international fees out of play than that of a, a American student. So it is the, that is where the competition comes in as well, because of course he has to look to pull his or her pocket um, for a little bit more funding than that of a, a American student. But if he decides to offer, if he or she decides to offer a full scholarship, a full scholarship it is, um, whether your tuition cost is maybe a thousand dollars more than a, a local student, he or she has to give you that full scholarship. Let's say if it's a head hunt sport. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, I have a, I have a follow-up question to that. When it when it comes down to traveling for a international prospective athlete student, does it does it also cover that, or is there something specific that they have to do for travel costs and pass, just passport everything? No, travel costs is actually on the the student and the parent. Oh. All right. So travel costs, the visa costs, insurance as well is something that the student and their parents have to look for as well. So when you think of a scholarship is really just tuition, the, the housing, if it is a full scholarship, um, books, um, associated fees. And of course, if you're at a division one level, there is um, a stipend that you could get for a cost of attendance. But when it comes to things like insurance, applying for your visa, um, traveling to and from to get to the actual university, that is a cost that is on you. All right, thank you. All right.
Any other questions before I move on? Okay, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if any, okay. So let's get to the process of, of college athletic recruitment. Um, now that you guys have a, a foundation, so to speak, um, on the, knowing the options that, that are available and the potential opportunities based on the sport and the type of scholarship and, and so forth, what steps do you need if you're an athlete um, to take to, to get recruited? And you know, this process can be confusing, it could be long, it could be tedious, especially if you are trying to go to an NCAA university where the rules and regulations are, are very strict compared to the other governing associations. But generally, the steps are pretty much the same. So here I have um, re researching colleges to get a general idea of what schools you are interested in, in terms of the program, the program majors, and of course, if those schools have the sport that you want to compete in. So it's really about finding the right fit. So fit is important. Yes, I know sometimes, though, if you are getting, a, let's say, a coach decides to offer you a scholarship, and it is really just that one coach that's offering a scholarship. This is something you probably won't pass up. But let's say there are student athletes who don't necessarily need a scholarship. You know, they're well off. They have, um, they could afford the funding of tuition. Or there might be some student athletes that have that are really good in terms of their skill set. And there are a lot of coaches, you know, approaching them and offering them scholarship, scholarships for, for their program. It's really now where you have to decide what, you have to make the right choice and this is where fit comes in so here you will see on on the slide that i have uh, academic and athletic fit and you really shouldn't really you really shouldn't consider these separately because they they tend to go hand in hand so when you start to look for a school um you know most students know what the intended major is i want to pursue accounts i want to pursue um sport management so once you know what major you want to pursue then it's really figuring out and what schools offer your major, then it's really to figure out, do those schools actually offer the sporting program that I want to compete in? So it's really the balance of the two. You might find a really good academic program that has, let's say accounts, but that school doesn't actually offer the sport that you want to compete in. So this is where the fit comes in. And then you look at the geographic setting. Now, a lot of us are from the Caribbean. We probably, you know, dislike the cold climates. So you have to ask yourself, do I want to go play in, I don't know, North Dakota? Um, do I want to play in a place that's going to be freezing cold? Um, how is this going to affect me when it comes to studying or concentrating? Um, you look at the division. What is the division like? Division one, as I mentioned before, for NCAA, the level is much higher than that of division two. You have to be realistic. Do you have the skill set to actually participate at a division one school? Um, when you look at those division one athletes, for example, basketball, they are, you can't be a 5'3", let's say 5'3" center or par four, we're trying to go to play center at a division one school, right? So this is where you have to be, you know, realistic about the whole thing. If you look at the profile on the academic site, do you meet the SAT requirements for admission for that particular school? Do you meet the GPA requirements? If you're looking to go to Ivy League school where the GPA um, and SAT scores, admission scores are really high and you are barely making the cut, can you really get accepted into Ivy League school? So these are all the things that you really have to consider. So all of this needs to be coordinated accordingly um, to really, the, the suggestion really is to make a college list. You want to really identify your dream schools, like what school do you really want to play at or compete at? So a list of about eight schools, you have your two dream schools, you have your three realistic schools based on everything that we would have, I would have touched on before in terms of fit. And then you have your three backup schools. Again, you're gonna cross check the different criteria for both academic from the academic and athletic side. And then you move from there, you know, you say, do I meet the criteria for a division one athlete? Do I really want to play? Can I, do I have the skill set to play at the division one school? Do I have the grades to be admitted into this particular um, university? So it's really about finding, as I said, the fit that is, that is right for you. Because at the end of the day, if you're going on a scholarship or um, you're going to play, you may be a walk-on, you want to be comfortable for those four years that you are actually at university or college. And of course, when you're comfortable, I, th I think you will tend to do your, your best as opposed to not being comfortable in the environment that you don't feel right. So it's always about finding, finding the right fit. Then you want to really familiarize yourself with the different requirements um, for each of these different 
association. So it's important. This is an important step because you have to really understand what is needed academically and athletically and basically taking the right courses and aligning those courses with the requirements needed. And this goes into something called the eligibility center. So to play collegiate sports at the NCAA Division, NCAA Division one and two, um, NAIA, there is also Youth Sports Canada, they have something called an eligibility center. And you really need to register with the eligibility center to be deemed eligible to, to compete in collegiate sports. So this really verifies if you are eligible both academically, if you meet the academic standards, um, if you are eligible athletically, they look to see, you know, was this person a professional in their, in their day? Did they play with professional teams? Did they take money? So they're big on amateurism, right? Um, so really meeting those criteria and then you would get the, the clearance from the, let's say the NCAA or the NA, NAIA, and then you can receive a scholarship if that is the route you're going. You can um, actually compete collegiately at this particular sport. So remember I mentioned before at the NCAA and well, colleges in the USA, the four-year colleges, the, you get four years of eligibility to compete collegiately at whatever sport. Um, in Canada, they usually give you five years of, of eligibility. So just to go a little bit into eligibility, this is a conversation in itself, like by itself, but to be, as I said, to be eligible to, el eligible to compete at the collegiate level within any of these sporting associations that you see here, um, prospectives and athlete must meet the, the academic and eligibility requirements specified by these respective governing bodies. And you would notice here I have the NCAA Division I illustration here. So it's saying that you have to basically complete 16 NCAA core courses. And a core course is basically a course that the, NJ, the NCAA deem important for any athlete entering university. They think that this is something that would be a good starting point. Once they complete these courses, they are right and they are ready to enter university. So when I say 16 core courses, you will notice it has English, um, it has a natural or physical science, you have the math, you have the social science, um, then maybe additional subjects, but it's really saying you need four years of English. And this is whether you'll be at secondary school or if you call it high school, you need to complete four years of English starting from year nine. So their year nine is really third form, or I don't know if you say form three. So that is like thir 13 years, 14 years of age when you're in third form, and they really start counting from form three. So let's say you're in third form, they say, okay, I did one year English in third form, I did another year English in fourth, another year in fifth, maybe I did one in upper six. So you have your four years completed. Then they're saying, okay, you need two years of a natural or physical science. So like the physics, the chemistry, the biology, then three years of math, um, two years of a social science. So for them, a social science is like government or civics, but for us, a social science could be anything. I wanna say from um, social studies, um, history, right? So. And then you have the four additional years. So let's say you decide, you know, you go to upper six and you do an extra year of math, you do a, a religious studies, you do maybe um, another physical science or natural science. This could make up your four additional credits or years. So when they, use, when they have credits here on the screen, it's really years to actually qualify to be eligible based on the NCAA Division I standards. Um, Division two is slightly different, but it, in terms of like how many years you need to do English or math, but it's similar um, here. And then you have to earn a GPA of at least 2.3 to be eligible. So they calculate the GPA based on your secondary school transcripts, not your CSET scores or your CAPE scores, but based on your secondary school um, courses and these same courses that I just outlined. So um, obviously we don't, I don't think a lot of uh, Caribbean secondary schools use a GPA system, but there's this calculator that they use to really convert a grade. So let's say you got a C if the grade is um, alphabetical and you got a C, that will really translate to like a 2.0 for them, all right? So once you get a GPA based on those subjects of 2.3 or higher, at the, you will qualify to be eligible at the division one level. If it's 2.2 or higher, you'll be qualified eligible at the division two level. And this is for NCAA. And then, of course, SAT requirements is a, a, a thing for the NCAA. Funny enough, this year and last year, they waived the SAT exam. So any student who was trying to um, get cleared at, from the eligibility center, this was kind of like the year to do it or last year because, you know, considering COVID, they made a, 
a lot of different waivers and they kind of shot the NC the, the SAT one side, but that didn't mean that actual universities weren't using the NC the SAT scores as a measure of admission. So yes, for the eligibility center, which is separate and distinct from a, the admissions of actual university, you might you know get through or get cleared by the eligibility center, but you still have to be admitted into the university that you're applying for. And they might require the SAT. But as I said, that is that was really only for this year and last year, considering the COVID pandemic. But you have to have a SAT score of uh, a certain level to be cleared according to the NCAA. And they use kind of like a sliding scale. So there's is like a chart where you have all the SAT scores and your GPA score. So the higher your GPA is, then you don't necessarily need a high SAT score. The higher your SAT is, then your GPA could be a little lower, but it has to be above the minimum, which is 2.3 or 2.2, all right? And then lastly, um, proof of graduation. So for them now, the proof of graduation, this is where the CSET um, or the CAPE com comes in. So they require, let's say about five passes at the CSET level. Um, they have different tiers, but let's say you're at CAPE, they require two um, passes at the CAPE level. And for them, that is a proof of graduation. They don't necessarily take the school leaving certificate as a proof of graduation. For them, they want to see um, the, the CSET grades for this particular case. All right. Um, other associations we have, they have the eligibility center as well. There is the NEIA and obviously they aren't as strict. Um, they have here, you would see um, a test score or a minimum SAT score of 970 and then a minimum GPA of 2.0. And they have class rank, but that isn't necessarily um, needed once you qualify for two. Of these two, of these three points, you would be eligible according to the, the NAIA standards. And then junior college and CAA is a, I think the easiest of the three. Once you graduate high school, that is, um, they don't have an eligibility center per se. So once you graduate high school, you are fine to play at the junior college level once you can show that you graduated high school. Um, Canada, the CCAA, they don't have an eligibility center, but your sports have an eligibility center. But how it works in Canada, they leave it up to the institution. So once you are eligible according to the rules of the institution, whether it be this is what your high school GPA needs to be, um, this is what the this is the the entry grades that you need need to meet, um, then you will be eligible to play in the Canadian. Um, collegiate circuit. And then of course the member conference are which of which their institution is a recognized member. So of course, once that institution, the college or university that you're attending is part of the, the conferences within the CCA or U sports, then you would be eligible to play. And then we have, where are we? So of course you want to, take the register with the, those appropriate eligibility centers that I would have mentioned before. Um, usually when you register, if you want to play at a university that is under the NCAA or NAIA, there is a cost um, to register. Sometimes I believe in Canada, the youth sports is like 50 Canadian dollars in the US. I think the NCAA is 135. That is either for the NCAA or the NAIA US dollars. So you, you pay, they give you a number, you have a unique identifier. So you have your NCAA number or your NEIA number. And then it's really just answering a bunch of questions. Um, filling out the form, you answer academic questions, athletic questions. Um, the form for NCAA is much more extensive than any other form because you know they were on their whole amateurism model. Now it's a little different now that athletes could actually get paid to play, but that is a topic for another day. But um, it's really just verifying that you meet the criteria, you have your grade sent from your schools, your transcript sent, your SAT score sent, and then once you are cleared, then um, they would give you something called an amateurism certificate, that is the NCAA or the NAIA will give you a certificate saying that you're cleared to compete at a school, and then you could go on. Um, you want to take the SAT exam, and of course this is needed for mostly in the USA for a four-year um, universities. Um, as I mentioned before, this was really waived for uh, this year and last year, according to the NC, the eligibility centers. But again, 
this doesn't mean that the institution that you're actually applying to um, don't require the SAT score. Uh, then really, how is a coach going to assess uh, what skills you have to really know if you are ideal for his or her team? You know, it's really hard for a coach to recruit someone that they can't see. And this is where the highlight videos come in, the skills videos. So when I say highlight videos, you have some sort of game footage. You participate in the basketball game. You have some footage that, you know, it just highlights you, your particular clips. Remember, these coaches get thousands of resumes and videos sent to them. So it's like they take probably 30 seconds to look. So when they see a highlight video, they don't want to watch a whole game. Um, they want to just say, you know what, this player is really good based on the clips that's single, that particular player. Oh, if they want to see more, then they will probably ask for a full game. But really highlight videos, the purpose of highlight videos is really to highlight that one particular person with those particular um, clips. Um, then there's skills video. If you want to supplement the highlight video and go a little bit deeper, you realize in the game, okay, um, I, was, I play, I don't know, power forward or whatever in basketball, but my skill set is so much more like I could be a point guard. So a skills video could actually show the coach that you have much more to offer. Um, and in this day and age, you know, where coaches can't travel like before, obviously we're getting back a bit to, bit to, to normal, but before coaches will go to showcases and tournaments um, to really scout players, but a highlight video is a really good tool. Our video is a really good tool to have now that you, you can easily share it online via a link, whether it be YouTube, Vimeo, or whatever the case may be, especially for us who are located in the Caribbean half miles away, you know, from colleges in the States where we can't necessarily pick up and, you know, drive to, let's say, Maryland or New York to actually attend a showcase or a tournament to show our skills to coaches. So these a highlight videos are a very good tool to have. Um, then there are recruiting video, recruiting resumes. Um, you know, in addition to visuals, a resume is really like a sports profile that can really supplement a video or vice versa. And it could really, you know, identify your academics, your grades, any sort of awards that you would have achieved, along with your athletic achievements. Um, if you're on a national team, if you played a particular tournament and got an award, um, your statistics are like, you know, if you are in a sport that requires jumping ability. So I'm pretty tall, I have a pretty good vertical jump. These are things that would be placed in your your resume or your online profile. And then of course, you could embed that same video link if it's online in that resume and share it easily with coaches. Um, so if I click here, so here is an example of a resume. Now all resumes don't look like this. Athletes can basically put together their own resumes um, on their own, um, go to websites like Canva um, to help them with the resumes. But this is an example generated from my website, Carib Athletes, and is really one where the fields are pre-designed um, based on the sport. So based on your sport, it will say, okay, I know if it's volleyball, she needs to have a vertical jump or a block jump. If it is um, football, is he left-footed or right-footed? So the fields are pre-generated and then you really just have to fill it in. Um, and, it's, and you wanna really make it easy to read. If a coach wants more based on what they initially see, they would ask for it. But you don't want to have your resume jumble and all this information because remember, there are thousands of athletes looking for scholarships or a place on a roster. So when a coach looks at your resume, they just wanna look and see the, the information in terms of height, if it's a sport that is height dependent, um, if, it is track depend if it's a track and field event, what speed is she running at? So they wanna see key things, yeah? So this is the idea, of course, you want to start tabulating your information early. I know as young, young people, we do things and we don't really note it, but if you got an award for a particular event, note it, like start noting your stuff early. So when it comes to preparing your resume to submit it, you don't have to be thinking, what year did I get this award or when did this happen? So start putting things on paper. Um, this here, basically this resume here on, the Carib Athletes website. This is one that can be downloaded after you complete it and can be easily shared with coaches via our website or even if you want to share it outhouse um, as well. Um, there's something called recruiting profile. So there are a lot of large recruiting sites that offer um, profiles where you could create a profile. You know, you have the athletics, the athlete section and the coaches section. So you could create a profile, much like Facebook in a sense. And then anybody could come online and look at your profile. So again, here, this is just an idea of how it looks on Carib Athletes, where you could create an online profile, you add all the relevant information, coach could view your profile, you could download and send your profile 
independently. So you could view your profile as a resume and send it. Um, usually when you go on the site, there is a, a directory. So let's say you are a basketball player and you know, you're really trying to figure out what schools in the US and Canada actually offer basketball programs. Here in this directory, you could find all of those schools. And of course, there are links that could direct you straight to their academic website or their athletic website to get more information. So it's basically all in one place. If you want to look for a particular, if you, let's say you want to add certain colleges to your favorite list to make it easier to find next time, if you do create a profile, you could add them to your list um, and so forth. So this is just an option. Um, anyone who is interested in learning more, they could sign up for a free um, profile on carabathletes.com. And of course, everything is in one place in terms of the directory where, let's say your basketball, volleyball, obviously there are only a few sports, um, but you could find every college program within Canada and USA in one place and links to those respective websites. So this is a coaches list as well. You could find the names of coaches and send the messages directly to their webs their inbox. So this is just the in-house coaching um, platform. And another way you could actually showcase your skills to coaches is via a uh, college recruiting assessment forms. Now, every single athletic program in the States have an athletic website and they have a college recruiting form, assessment form. So if you were to go to, let's say Duke, dukedevils.com if that is their website I don't know but you would find if you are a prospective recruit you would find a, a college recruiting assessment form where based on the sport the, there's certain things that the coach will want to know and this really gives an idea for the coach to see who's really interested in, in his or her program so this is a way that you could actually you know show your interest as well to to the coach um, then you want to be able to uh, contact the coaches having your resume, having your profile, having your video, sending an introductory email to coaches and letting them know, you know, this is your stuff. This is my resume. You're interested in playing it for their particular sport program. This is my video. Just, it's like going fishing in a sense. You're, you're going fishing to see which coach would actually bite back. Now, this could be a struggle for many because a lot of coaches won't respond but you have to be persistent. And this is where discipline comes in and those, all those soft skills that you learn through sport. You Rejection shouldn't be something that comes into your mind because imagine you're competing against thousands of other athletes. So being persistent um, and being determined to continue to send follow-up emails and so forth, especially if it's a program that you think you, you would fit well in and you have the skill set that that coach is looking for, you have to be persistent. Yeah. And then of course, it's working with your, your school counselors or your school. I find here in Barbados in particular, I don't know how it works in other Caribbean islands, a lot of students, they tend to move late, they get opportunities, but they tend to move late and then it's really a struggle getting their grades sent because the grades have to be sent directly from the school to, let's say, the eligibility centers or the admission at the various schools and, you know, it takes a little while trying to get the grades sent directly from the school. So this is something that you have to be on top of if you want to go, let's say, meet the preseason or whatever date the coach wants you to be there. So just being proactive um, is a key when it comes um, to the, the recruitment process and being on top on top of things. And once all of that is done, um, once you have gained some sort of interest from the coach and the coach has recruited you, you have cleared the, um, all of the requirements based on the eligibility center, you have been accepted into a, a university or college, it is really about you committing to the school um, and usually when you commit, you really sign a document um, in the U.S. is the National Letter of Intent, um, NLI, and this really states your intention of playing for that particular university. So it's really like a, a contract, so to speak, saying, you know what, I intend to play collegiate football, collegiate soccer at this particular university. Um, and then, of course, once you get recruited, you get your something called an I-20, document which is sent to you with all the details regarding your scholarships and your funding and that is a needed document to get your student visa and then is really getting everything in, in place and going to compete and pursue your undergraduate degree so these steps basically are a broad type of overview of the steps it goes much deeper when it comes to the particular requirements for each association as i said the ncaa is much more strict and requires a lot more but you could anyone could use this as a template for each each association. Now, um, 
you would realize that this process though isn't singular by any means and what i mean by that like we tend we will have athletes who are really talented like i find people in the caribbean they have talent they have that raw talent but when it comes to academics they might struggle a bit but remember you are a student athlete first you have to get admitted into school as you could have 100 coaches recruiting you because you have that skill set but if you don't have the grades to meet the admission requirements for the eligibility centers and for that particular university then what does that mean you can't actually go and compete collegiately yeah so bear that in mind that academics play, play a, a huge role when it comes to the requirements um, to get admitted into into a school all right so it's really a parallel process between academics and athletic and bear in mind student comes before athletes so it's really about grades first to get that chance to play as i said collegiate a collegiate sport so what could go wrong and this is where um, the student uh, doesn't meet the eligibility academic or amateurism standards so you could submit all your information and then realize you didn't get your eligibility certificate because of course you probably if you're looking at the ncaa division one level you didn't do the core courses that were required um, you received poor advice from someone um, you didn't meet the admission standards of that particular school. So you got a scholarship, a coach is willing to offer you a scholarship, but then your, let's say your S SAT scores aren't, aren't high enough to be admitted. And then of course we have those unrealistic expectations that I would have mentioned before, you know, parents and students where you think you are at a certain level, but then you, you really aren't. So you have to be realistic and you know what, you could, everything is online. You could actually go online see what the statistics are. When I say statistics, what is the height of a division one college athlete? What is their vertical jump like? Um, what, it, what are their skill sets like? You could see this thing, these things online via the internet, um, all the resources out there. So you could really get an idea of what level you need to be at for particular divisions and conferences. Um, and then of course, there are different ethical dilemmas. Let's say you are being recruited to a, I don't know, a, a Catholic school, but you know, you and your family might be of a different religion and that could be an issue. Um, there are different things that come into play as well. And then lastly, you start the process too late. And I think this comes in, the pro the starting the process too late happens to those athletes who are trying to go to the NCAA Division I school where core courses are important. Meaning that if you don't start following the core courses that are required at the NCAA Division I level from form three or third form, then you struggle to, you know, I have to take science for a year, right? I need to take extra year of math and that could actually, uh, make that scholarship, let's say you had a scholarship, that scholarship could go to someone else because of course a coach is not gonna necessarily wait on you and there are other athletes out there trying to, that are probably just as good and they're trying to fill their roster spots, right? So starting the process on time is, is, is very, very important. So I'm just gonna share to kind of wrap up a timeline of what you should do based on the years in terms of if you're, if you're in third form, this is where you, what you should be doing. If you're in fourth or form four, this is what you should be doing. So. Here we have um, the timeline for third form. And according to the NCAA, this is where you start. This is year nine for them. And this is where they really start counting your GPA um, based on the core courses you are doing. Um, so this is really a planning year. You know, you're really 13 here or 14 here. So you want to basically understand what is needed. And this, and if you want to compete, let's say at the NCAA division one level or division two courses, knowing the courses, the core courses that are required and, the, and earning the best grades, that is important. So just reviewing like the, the guidelines for the academic standards based on the country. So there's a manual the NCAA produced um, and they have it by each country, like what is required per country in terms of like what you need to produce to show your proof of graduation and so forth. Um, then of course you have to sign up for, in year nine you can't sign up for a, the eligibility account, but you could actually sign up for a, pre, a free profile page just to get started. And, you know, from there you want to explore college websites. Again, you could join Carib Athletes and see the list of collegiate programs and go explore their websites. Do they have the program that you want? Do they have the major that you want? And really start documenting your achievements in school and sport that comes into play. Um, this will help when it comes to create your, your actual recruiting resume or online profile. Um, have your matches recorded, what your statistics were like. Um, you know, this is very important. You know, we live in the Caribbean, so unless you happen to be like on a national team where you get to travel to compete, you know, where scouts are 
watching or happen to come see you play, the only way a coach could really see you is through a video. So then this is not where you have to start saying, you know what, I need to create a video or a resume to really showcase, showcase my skills. So videos are important. I wouldn't necessarily say create it at 13 years old because there's so much development that happens between 13 and 18. But thinking about it is, as I said, this is really the planning, the planning year. And then in full form, you, you want to continue with the search. Um, obviously, you're trying to figure out what you really want to do in college. So really trying to continue with the search, um, create your potential list of schools that you would like to go to. Remember, I mentioned the, the, the dream list, the backup schools, the, the realistic schools, just getting that on paper. Um, stay on track of the, your courses, your academics, making sure that, you know, if you want to go that top, the division one level or division two level, you're on track with the courses that you need to take. Um, and here now you could actually register with for a certification account with the NCAA, the NAIA, and really get things going. I think when you register with these accounts, they actually guide you along the way. They say, okay, you need this, you need that, you need this. So this is a good step, of course, but that is if you could afford it. Sometimes students wait to see what kind of coaches are recruiting them, whether they're from the NAIA, the junior college, the NCAA, and then they decide, you know what? This coach seems to be really keen on me, so I'm going to go register with the NCAA if the coach is from the NCAA. If you could afford it and could register with all, so be it, but there is a cost. So that is why I say some students actually wait to see um, who is actually recruiting them and decide to register with the appropriate eligibility center. And then really, you want to start um, putting together that information. Uh, you want to be proactive in a sense. So coaches won't necessarily know that you are out there unless you reach out to them. Um, obviously, there are different ways to do this. So you could reach out via email. As I said, you want to add your resume. If you create your resume and your video, um, there are a lot of colleges overseas that offer summer camps. So they kind of use summer camps as a way to actually scout players as well. Um, their showcases, if you could afford to travel and go to a showcase. Again, it all depends considering the situation that we're in now with the pandemic, if those are actually available, but recruiting showcases are ways that you could actually showcase your skills. Because as I said, everybody is not going to make a traveling national squad or a team. So these are options that you can consider. And then it's really trying to create your highlight video. If you are on a team, if you are playing a competition with a particular group or, or program. Yeah, make sure you record your video, even if someone is, you hire professional serv services to do it for you, it's really about trying to create a highlight video. And fifth form, now this is where you really start to narrow down your college list and the possible schools that you would like to visit if you can't afford to visit or if the coach is recruiting you, there's something called official visits. Now you could get five official visits, um, to schools where you can see if, you know, this school is right for me. You might say, yeah, this is right for me. But when you go to official visit, you realize, no, I don't want to be here, right? So if you have the opportunity to take an official visit, I would take it. Um, here you want to prepare for the SATs, um, study. You know, the SAT exam is different from what we are accustomed to at, here in the, the Caribbean. So this is an exam that you actually have to prepare and study for. Sometimes I find a lot of students in the Caribbean, they have to take it more than once because the first time is really like a, a test for them where they really see what it is. Although there are pre-SAT um, exams that you could take online and get, go to lessons, I, I just think that a lot of people tend to take it twice. So I wouldn't necessarily wait to last minute when you know that you are being recruited by a coach to take the SAT because again, there are thousands of athletes out there waiting and a coach could simply pick somebody else that has just as much skills that you have, all right? Again, you want to make sure that you're on track with your NCAA courses. Of course, if that is the route, you want to continue to reach out to coaches. Um, like there are a bunch of restrictions though when it comes to the NCAA and the periods of times, there are things like contact period and dead period. So it might seem like if a coach is giving you the cold shoulder and not responding, but they could be um, being aware of the periods like the restriction periods could be beneficial to you. So you know if a coach isn't responded, it could be because they're in a dead period where they can't necessarily contact an athlete or an athlete can't, let's say, show up to campus. So there are all these different rules when it comes to the restrictions and the timeline. So being aware of that is important as well. If you created a video before, update your resume or your video. If you know between a year um, or two that you excel tremendously in your skills or maybe your height, 
nothing is wrong with creating an additional video and that shows progress you know you show coach the initial video and a second video and they see your progression through time and then of course again attending uh, summer camps if you can a uh, collegiate college summer camp or recruiting showcase could always go go far away and now we are in sixth form we can start applying to colleges and universities because now you have the your grades back or you're getting some of your grades back you probably did your sat where you could send um that is a requirement um you could send your your scores if you let's say you did the sats and your score wasn't the best you don't necessarily have to send the first score if your second score is better you send the the, the better the, the better of the two um you want to make sure you pass your kit or the second exams and then really requesting your final amateurism certificate from the eligibility center or the whichever eligibility center to really get you on the way and of course you have to graduate because graduating is key especially from secondary school and having your official transcript sent accordingly so these are really this is really just a kind of a guide based on what you should be doing um just a couple of tips <laughs> again taking the right courses of course studying hard um remember that as student athletes or prospective student athletes, you need to really meet the academic eligibility requirements first uh, to be eligible to be enrolled in that particular institution. Um, you want to keep your grades up. Again, if you did the SATs and you're not proud of your score and you think you could do better, you want to retake that, but it is key to do it somewhat. I would say doing your SATs maybe in fifth or um first year in sixth form is fine so if you need to do it in the second year in sixth form is fine because bear in mind different countries have different dates that the sat is actually offered so you might go on the college board website which is the official sat website and realize that they have all these dates that you could take the sats but let's say in barbados there's only five dates per year in st lucia i don't know what the dates are like so you have to be mindful that you want to align yourself to take the SAT at the right time so you wouldn't miss out on a potential opportunity as well. Again, finding the right fit, you know, you want to consider a range of colleges and universities and of course trying to find the right fit. And being proactive, like contacting coaches at colleges, you can't be afraid if you're really trying to reach out, um, contacting coaches, sharing your resume, your highlight video. Um, you have to be at a certain skill set if you're trying to get a scholarship or compete at the collegiate level, so you've got to train hard. Um, this skills come into play here as well. And then if you need to apply for financial assistance, whether it be through grants, through scholarships, if you have a student revolving loan fund in your country, if you are receiving the type of partial scholarship, you still have to show that you can meet the other financial obligations, not you aren't gonna get your student visa. You know, the embassy is very stern when it comes to making sure that you could survive if you go abroad. So you have to prove that you actually have the financial backing to actually qualify pay for your tuition or your room and board um and then understand what you're assigning uh you know sometimes the documentation is very wordy so knowing what you actually sign if you don't understand it sitting with someone to help you go through the de details please understand what you're signing before you sign it usually when you sign documents you're committing to a particular university especially the nli the letter of intent when you sign that you already commit to that university for a year and then let's say there's another opportunity that comes along if you're looking at the NCAA, there's another school offering something better in the same conference. You committed to that university for a year, so you have to sit out basically a year if you don't want to go to that school before you could go and actually compete collegiately at this other school that is within the same conference. Of course, if there's a different association, the, the rules aren't as strict, but be mindful of, you have to be mindful of, of, of what you're assigning. So reading and understanding what is actually on the paper that you get. So just a couple of takeaways. I, I know I mentioned a lot and it is a lot of information, but I'm hoping that, you know, you honest, if it, anything that you took away, there's something that you understood to help you um, throughout the process. But if you, anyone here needs additional help, you could always reach out to myself at Care Athletes. Basically what we do, we help with just the initial assessment, you know, where you're at and where you're trying to go. Um, the academic and athletic eligibility assessments as well, what grades you have, what you would really um, qualify for, what universities you'll be eligible for, uh, what skill set you're at, and really just giving guidance along those lines, whether when it comes to athletic and academic support, connecting with coaches, 
Um, as I mentioned before, we have a directory of all the collegiate sporting programs for particular sports, but all in the USA and Canada for volleyball, basketball, um, track and field, and football, Caribbean football, that is. And you know, you could create your academic profile, you could create a resume. When I say academic profile, that's more of an online document where you could actually share with coaches and they could visit the site and see your profile. And we obviously do highlight and skills videos. Obviously, we're based in Barbados, so doing recording videos that is obviously exclusive to Barbadian athletes, but it doesn't mean that we can't edit and create videos that you already have and put together. And recruiting resumes, that is another platform our tool that we have where you could easily just enter your information and create your resumes accordingly. And then one-on-one -on -one consult consultation along the way, guidance along the way, basically different steps and if you're on the right path and guiding you accordingly. Okay, so this is a couple takeaways. I, you guys could visit the website, um, www.carabathletes.com. As I said, you could create a free online profile. And really what that gives you is access to a bunch of colleges and, and associations all in one place for your particular sport where you could filter accordingly, whether you want to filter by country, division, play, sport. Um, you could create your recruiting resume. You could share it with coaches. You could see coaches who are online and so forth. Um, and if anyone here wants uh, to talk a little bit more, you could also email. I have my contact details on that page where you could schedule a free 50 minute consultation to actually learn, learn more. So if there are any, this is the end of the presentation. If there are any questions, um, comments or queries, I can take it now. From anyone? You could speak or you could put it in the chat. No, I hope I didn't board anyone, but if there aren't any questions, I would say thanks to everyone who attended and hopefully um, the, the information was useful. And as I said, if you want to reach out, this is my contact information here on the page. You could reach out via these email, my email address on website, or you could find us on these social media platforms. And that is it for me. Thank you very much. Well, everyone is giving some very positive feedback, very informative, very useful. Overall, I enjoyed the presentation. I think that is something that most people do not know about. So the recording will be available on our YouTube channel for persons who missed it.